Hey guys, I want to make a video about how people around the world find meaning in meaningless things. Um, this is something that I've seen, you know, a lot lately. I see it more and more where people will try to find meaning in meaningless things. They're looking for the secret knowledge. They're looking for the secret to something. They're trying to look too deep into basic things. Um, I, I want to give some examples of, of the problem of that, but also it goes into where people look for meaning in the Bible and take tr they, they create a false doctrine or something that is, has a completely different meaning and twist it out of context to create a, their own meaning, and I want to show examples of that too. Not all of this is about Christianity itself, but I, I want to show how the same superstition and, and mindset actually has trickled in it's really not you know a pagan thing it's not a christian thing it's a human nature to where we try to find meaning in the meaningless and god warns us not to do this you know he is the meaning of life the secret to life is love and that god so loved the world you know the the, the secret is christ and that he loved us so much that he would die for us but we try to find meaning in other things in the bible we try to find secrets in the bible when the Lord, for the most part, paints everything clearly. Sometimes he makes us look, but he doesn't hide it in secret ways that only the very wise can you know, find out. I mean, technically, everyone who believes is wise, but <clears throat> it's not done in a secret way. It's, not, it's done openly for, to where the simple and the intelligent can all understand. So, <clears throat> for an example... I wanted to bring up something that I've heard, you know, when I was growing up. It was a superstition, but it's it's an example of people finding meaning in something that's meaningless. And it's the legend of the uh, black woolly caterpillar. And it says, legend has it that the amount of the black on a woolly caterpillar, and I'm reading from here, will predict how cold the upcoming winter will be. The black of the caterpillar supposedly means that the winter will be colder. And the more segments that are black will determine how many weeks of cold weather the winter will have. Okay, this is really silly. <laughs> this is just honestly kind of dumb. But I've heard this. I heard this when I was a you know little kid. I've had people in you know my family say this. You know, and I don't think they believed that they were just telling me that. You know, because it's a legend of superstition. This one's pretty harmless because I don't think anyone ever actually believed that. Maybe they did a long time ago, but no one in my family actually believed that. They were just telling me that. You know, to pull my leg. You know, you know, just telling me. But we have other superstitions that are similar, just like the whole Groundhog Day event where they, you know, release, well, I forget the name of the Groundhog, but they release it to see if he sees his shadow. Anyway, it says right here, this is it, de it derives from the Pennsylvania Dutch superstition that if a groundhog emerges from its burrow on the day that, on this, on this day, and sees its shadow, it will retreat into its den and winter will go on for six more weeks. Now, this is really silly also. Like, who comes up with this? How, who is the one who's seeing this information and coming up with these ideas? They're looking into something too much and, and, and gathering, you know, taking too much from absolutely nothing. And I, I want to go on and show you how this gets deeper, where we go into this is... A pagan ritual here, and you've probably heard the, the saying before, which is the reading of the tea leaves. And it, and it says, this is a phrase borrowed from <clears throat> the divination practice of identifying symbols and interpreting messages in the patterns of tea leaves at the bottom of a, and I think it's a, a, a cuppa, or is a cup, I don't know, I think it's this thing right here. <clears throat> I didn't, I, I never did any of this, but I, even, you know, before I was saved, so I, I don't know exactly what all of that means, but it basically, the whole ritual is to put tea leaves into a cup and look at the bottom, and this is going to determine someone's future path, like or future events. It's just like you're looking into the meaningless, trying to find meaning, and this is something that I see happen so much today. And you can just scroll through the news, and you can, and you can, if if you sit there and you and you read that stuff too much and try to find meaning out of and figure out what's going on in the world. A lot of it comes from a place where people they want to be informed, but there's it's a lot of it is just meaningless. So I want to move on and, and show you how this can affect even Christians or Christian groups 
whether whatever you think of the Catholics, it's not just a Catholic thing. I could find other examples of this in, in Protestant denominations, but this is tram, transubstantiation. And basically, this is looking too much into the scriptures and pulling something out of them that isn't exactly true. This is, if you don't know what transubstantiation is, it's basically, sorry, I, I, I didn't actually prepare of how to explain this. Basically, the, the Catholics believe that, uh, the body or the communion, the bread and the wine, literally turn into the blood of Christ. That we are physically, as you eat it, I guess as soon as it goes into your stomach or whatever, I don't know exactly how they believe that happens, but it actually turns physically into the body of Christ. And it's looking too much into John 6 right here. And I want to talk about it. I'm going to go over John 6 quite a bit. Yeah, quite a bit of it I have highlighted here, but I want to go back to this real quick. But this is another just superstition looking too much into the scriptures and not actually paying attention and studying what he's saying. You just take little pieces out of context and you're, you're gathering too much information. You're looking into meaningless things. And it's not that this is meaningless, but you're looking into the meaningless. It's like looking and in, in, in seeing the word had not come and then making some big deal about just a few little words. You're not looking at the entire picture. You're looking to, into just these little th things that are meaningless and making these huge deals about them, making it to where, you know, it's a tea, it, you know, leaves in the bottom of a cup, and now you're making this out to be some sort of, like, way to predict the future. You, you know, telling people, instead of looking to God, to go look into a cup and look at stupid dead tea leaves you know, leave, you know, plant leaves, plant matter to determine your future. It, that is so stupid. And that's part of Satan's plan is to get you to go bow to, it, it's why God in, you know, the Old Testament all the time was so against people bowing to idols because it's, it's you, a created being bowing to an inanimate object that can't save you. It's, it's, you create this image and then it's, not living, it's just made of gold or whatever it was, stone, and then you bow down to it, and there's so many blasphemies there, and it, it, it's making a mockery of God, to be honest. Making a mockery of you and of God. Alright, I wanted to go over here to Isaiah 55, 2-3, and this is also in the New King James Version. He goes on to say, or he, he says, Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your wages for that that does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. So I, I wanted to tie this in back to Ecclesiastes where he goes on to talk about the vanity of the world and this basically sums up all of the things and I'm going to go ahead and read Ecclesiastes here in just a second. It's first Ecclesiastes First Ecclesiastes 1, but this sums up everything that I was talking about, how everything is vanity, everything is meaningless, everything is worthless. All these things are just superstition, worthless, meaningless, unfulfilling, unsatisfying things. And I want to go, before I do that, I should have finished over here with John 6. I, I wanted to talk about transubstantiation. Um, on down here, he goes on to say, and this is Jesus speaking, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. And this is where this comes from. This is where that doctrine sort of comes from. It also comes from the Last Supper. But I want to go on, and, and there's a point at the end of this to prove that the Catholics aren't really right about this. And he goes, and I'll get to that in just a second. Let me just read this. And he goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness that are dead. This is the bread that, which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Jesus, in verse 51 right here, says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Any, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And the Jews called amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, they it's against the Jewish law to eat human flesh also. So, it, it, anyway, that's another point. You can take that up with the Catholics. Anyway, I think the Lutherans believe that too, but I'm not trying to bash anyone. It's just... When you go on to read in verse 53 down here, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And he goes on to you know talk about this. 
But the point I wanted to make is that when he goes on down, many disciples left him. It, it says right here in verse 60, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying, who can understand it? And many of them left him. I think, it, does it say that here? I don't know. It says that in one one place, it, it's one of the Gospels, it says many people left him at that point. Um, I think it, it, it might be in this. But anyway, he goes on to down here. He goes on down. Or I On down here, he says... In verse 63, it is spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and, and, they, and they are life. And he goes on to say, there, but there are some of you who do not believe, because he knew who would betray him, which was obviously talking about Judas. But um, the point is, is it says, the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Which means he, he wasn't speaking physically. Yes, we consume. We have to consume Christ in the sense that we have to completely go all in and believe in Him. But what we, you know, we can't actually go physically gather Him and eat Him, and and that goes again. You know, he wasn't speaking of that. He was basically trying to get the people to understand who he was, that he is Yahweh, that he is the Messiah, and that he's the he is the bread that comes down from heaven. Meaning, he is the one who gave the bread to Moses. He's he is the one that that will satisfy, don't labor, don't work, don't strive for the the earthly things, focus upon the heavenly things. And a lot of them, they couldn't understand between they were only thinking carnally. They're only thinking, they weren't thinking spiritually. They didn't even realize that he had, di- he had you know, done a miracle. Like they, they knew that he fed them, but they didn't even realize what he actually did. And like how he, because there was not enough fish, you know, and, and bread to feed that many people, but they didn't really even perceive that. They were just p- completely carnal, so he spoke in a way that would offend them. Trying to wake them up, some of them, but also speaking the truth, but it's spirit, and you have to, you know, believe in spirit to even be saved. And, and if you just look at things carnally, is and this is the whole point tied together, if you're just looking at things on the surface, if you're just looking at things through the flesh, you can come up with weird, you know, <laughs> these are a little extreme, but you can come up with weird superstitions or, you know, wrong doctrine, like we see right here, which actually believes that it, you know, converts in your stomach or whatever, the, the uh, communion. All right. I want to go on and I guess I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 1 right here. It's the vanity of life, and it's... <sighs> I'm just going to read from verse 2. It says, Vanity vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor, in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away, another generation comes, but, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continu- continually and comes again on its circuit. All rivers run to the sea. Yet the sea is not full. To the place in which the rivers come, they all return again. All things are full of labor. Men cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, and the ear is not filled with hearing. And I have this highlighted. I have this highlighted right here. It goes on to say, "There's nothing new under the sun." But the point I have this highlighted is: is the eye is not satisfied with with seeing. It wants to look and see more when there's nothing. The ear is not satisfied with hearing. It wants to hear different... It's kind of like how we're never satisfied hearing the mysteries. We always want more, but none of it actually satisfies. And this is where I I tie this back in, where why do you spend money on which is not bread and your wages for that which does not... and your wages for what does not satisfy? The point and the problem with doing all these things, the point and the problem... You know, to coming up with all these uh, superstitions and doctrines is they don't satisfy. Only the truth, only the truth that you can get by being honest and coming to the Lord, you know, in truth, wanting to know all truth, but only through His point of view can you be satisfied. And obviously the truth leads you to Christ, and, you know, Christ explains it all, and we get the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, you know. But <clears throat> when you're outside of that, when you're just looking with your own carnal mind, when you don't have the Holy Spirit, it comes up with things that do not satisfy. It comes up with weird rituals or weird superstitions that are just silly. So I want to give, I always like to try to end on a comforting note, and this is, you know, Ecclesiastes can be kind of depressing, but he's, he's 
making a point how everything is vanity and none of this matters. The only thing that matters is the Lord and love and, and that relationship with God. All right, this is 1 Corinthians 2 9. And this is just to comfort it's, but I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. So I thought that was a good verse to end with that it says, The eye is not satisfi- satisfied with seeing and the ears is not, nor the ear filled with hearing. We will be satisfied with seeing and and hearing in heaven. He will satisfy all of that. He already satisfies that, where we do not thirst. We have, you know, the the living waters, the you know, the living waters from inside of us after believing in Christ. But in heaven, it's going to be that times ten, where we don't have to look to these weird superstitions for meaning. We're not lost in the world looking into cups and tea leaves to try to determine the unknown. I mean, it's it's a little bit silly, and I shouldn't laugh at it, because there's people that do that, and, and they've done that in the past, and these silly stup- superstitions and silly rituals, and, you know, it it doesn't work. The only thing that works is coming to the Lord, getting to know the Lord, and then He will satisfy all of those things. And when you're really seeking the Lord, when you're really wanting to know the truth, it you'll never, ever get deceived by these stupid, you know, I don't know. I guess you just call them rituals. All right. That's about it. God bless and take care.